everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening, Radiation Safety in the Practice of Cardiology, the Latin America Experience, presented by Medtronic Latin America, Selassie, and Women as One. My name is Erica Squarey, and I'll be your host this evening. I am the Head of Engagement for Women as One, and I will introduce our wonderful speakers here in just a moment. But before we get started, I just have a few overview slides to orient us to today's conversation. So for our agenda today, we will have a talk for about 60 minutes. Uh, we will hear from Dr. Sheila Sani on radiation safety, the trends and views of the pregnant cardiologist, radiation safety basics, how to create a culture of change, discussion, and then we will then move into a discussion on radiation safety specifically in Latin America by Dr. Carla Agatiello and Dr. Nora Ined Lucana. And then we will, I totally messed it up, so Nora, you can say your right name when we get to your speakers. And then we will do a resource highlights from uh, Women as One and have Medtronic Latin America uh, close us out with some uh, end statements. Just a couple of notes for folks that are a little bit newer to Zoom webinars. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button as well as a chat feature. And feel free to use either if you have questions for the audience as we talk. We are also very excited to have Medtronic offer translation services in both Spanish and Portuguese. So thank you to Medtronic Latin America for providing that. And we'll also be recording this session. So why are we here today? Uh, there's a couple of things we'd like to accomplish. We'd like to review radiation exposure during pregnancy and dosing limits, understand radiation safety best practices, as well as discuss real life examples on radiation exposures uh, to talk about how we can shift cultural perspectives. So I am honored to introduce our speakers tonight and I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen so we can see them a bit better. Uh, so let's start with Sheila. Do you wanna introduce yourself to the audience, please? Hi everyone, good evening and thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Sheila Sani. I am an interventional cardiologist here in the USA in Clark, New Jersey. I'm also the director of our Women's Heart Program, very passionate about radiation safety to empower women in our incredible field of interventional cardiology. Thanks, Sheila. Carla, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi everybody, my name is Carla Gatiello. I'm interventional cardiologist too. I work at an Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires in Argentina. I'm in charge of TAVI program in my place, and I'm coordinator of uh, Mujeres Intervencionistas Latinoamericanas from Solasi. So we are I'm really very pleased to be here today. Thanks, Carla. And Nora? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm a vascular surgeon in Mexico City and I do a private practice and I used to have a great connection with training, trainees and all about, well, all the safety and radiation and it's a great pleasure to thank you. Thank you all, great. So Sheila, do you wanna get us started and share your screen and we can learn a little bit about radiation safety? Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see the Google Chrome? Uh, yes, we can see it looks great. Okay, fantastic. So let's begin. I think that was an excellent introduction for why we're here, why are we talking about radiation safety in the practice of cardiology? And the reason why we're talking about it is because it's not being talked about. And because there's a lack of awareness or even a lack of knowledge of radiation safety practices, there's a lot of concern that doesn't have a forum to be discussed or clarified. And there's been a lot of misinformation and miscommunication. So let's just take this from the perspective of a woman who is considering the field of cardiology. And what are some of the family planning considerations that she has to think about at all stages of preconception, pregnancy, and early parenthood? And for the focus of today's talk from this central illustration from 
Jack, and that was published you know, through a group from the ACC. Let's focus on pregnancy. During a woman's pregnancy or early pregnancy, um, what we do know about women cardiologists is that a lot of them avoided pregnancy during periods of radiation exposure. So women are actually making strategic plans to avoid the cath lab or even vo avoid the nuclear medicine lab when they're considering pregnancy, which is not accurate. They shouldn't be doing that and it could affect their training. Similarly, women who were pregnant or just training in general at formative years underutilized radiation reduction strategies as well as monitoring strategies. And that's really concerning because as we listen to this lecture, what's important is about knowing how to monitor the dose and to practice good quality safety measures that stay with you through your whole career. And what is really an ask, and I think what Women as One has tried to do and champion globally, is we really need to get radiation exposure training and safety out there. Women need to know, regardless of where they are, women need to know how they can be kept safe and they can have a career as well as a family and how they can do it safely. Um, some of the strategies to do that are gonna be discussed, most of them, but information that you're gonna be safe when you're pregnant is number one, and you will be. And the second is how can we keep you safe and what are those important strategies? It's important to know that you always wanna be connected to your radiation safety officer and we'll talk about other important techniques. So, just to clarify that a little bit more, there are a lot of perceived challenges and I've already given some background, but let's talk about some data. When asked why cardiologists did not pursue interventional cardiology, which if you just pause right there, right? There's three women on this call and we love our field, but can you imagine that women more commonly actually said it was the radiation exposure compared to men, 20% versus 12%, and that was statistically significant and pretty sad considering that radiation exposure during pregnancy can be safe. When compared with women older than 40 years of age, women less than 40 were twice as likely to report radiation exposure as a barrier to choosing interventional cardiology. And when it came to finding out how much women really knew about radiation exposure, if their department had an official policy, only 30% reported that they knew that their department had an official policy. 34% reported they didn't know. And 32% reported that their department did not. So when you are declaring your pregnancy, knowing where to go is really important. And if your department is not being upfront about that when you're considering your job, it's an important thing to ask about because it's your right. Um, in terms of women who were above the age of 50 and younger than 50, it's important to know that women above the age of 50, radiation exposure didn't necessarily affect their choices, but that's probably intuitive. Women below the age of 50 are probably making more family planning considerations. In terms of where we can go for guidelines, right? Because there is misinformation for so many years and even still, women in certain parts of the world, when they are pregnant, are told they cannot be in the cath lab. Certain private practices have actually shunned women physicians from being in the cath lab early on in their career when they had just joined the practice. And this caused a movement of a lot of societies to come together, but I wanna give the most recent data. And to date, interventional radiology has probably the most recent data and, and updated guidelines for occupational radiation exposure for physicians. And these come from 2015. It was a joint guideline by the Society of IR, Interventional Radiology, and the Cardiovascular and Interventional Radiology Society of Europe. And they addressed radiation exposure in both the academic and the private sector, which is important. Sometimes exposures are different. They also acknowledge that pregnant radiation workers may have a heightened concern of radiation risk of an unborn child. Yes, they do. So it's good that they acknowledge that. They addressed misinformation <coughs> surrounding reproductive and developmental risks of radiation exposure and its effect on the fetus. And they emphasized an understanding of radiation doses and the associated risks 
that is both necessary for protection of the fetus as well as preventing discrimination in the workforce and putting unnecessary constraints on pregnant women physicians. So there are occupational dose limits that have been set forth, set forth by the National CRP, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, as well as the International, as well as the European Commission. And let's go through those because they're slightly different but somewhat similar. For the NCRP, the monthly equivalent limit dose is 0.5 millisieverts to the embryo or the fetus. And that excludes medical nat natural background radiation once the pregnancy is declared. And it's important to know that this fetal dose is actually measured by the fetal dosimeter that goes inside your lead apron, not outside. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has a regulatory limit of five millisieverts during the entire pregnancy for the declared pregnant woman. And for the European and International Commission, the equivalent dose to the unborn child should be as low as reasonably achievable and should not exceed one millisievert during the duration of the pregnancy. What's really remarkable is that women who are pregnant in the cath lab usually do not exceed 0.03 millisieverts per month or even throughout the correction duration of the entire gestation. So these limits set forth are pretty large, meaning women don't even get to these limits. And that's what's really important to know. What are the, the risks for women to know about when they're not even in, uh, exposed to radiation? In other words, if you were a woman who's pregnant without exposing yourself to a field that's going to have radiation, what are your risks in pregnancy? And I was quite alarmed when I read this. Just a pregnancy alone has a, anywhere from 10 to 14% risk of spontaneous abortion. This is without being an interventional operator. Genetic abnormalities are as high as 4 to 10%. Intrauterine growth retardation can happen at a rate as high as 4%. And a major congenital malformation can happen 2 to 4%. And these rates are usually higher if you're older. So one fun way of kind of looking at this, because I'm throwing out numbers, how do we put them in context? The known threshold for a fetus is 100 millisieverts. So if we were to go back to those, I'm going to go back to them because I really, well, actually, I don't have to. Look at the green dot. So if you look at the blue dot, that's the known threshold, 100 millisieverts. What's been set forth by most of the societies is the green bubble. Five millisieverts is the legal dose limit for the entire gestation. Take a look at the pink dot. This is how much the fetus of a working pregnant interventionalist is estimated to receive over the entire gestation. And if you look at the orange dot, which is approximately 0.3 millisieverts, that's the underlead dose, so the actual fetal dosimeter. These are really small numbers, and they by no means exceed the limits that have been set forth by the regulatory societies. So this is a very good illustration to keep in mind. Just want to see, I've used about 15 minutes of time, so I'll make sure I continue to uh, talk as fast as possible. Um, so, so just to reiterate, the safe radiation dose for the pregnant cardiologist is going to be less than 50 millisieverts or 5 rems is considered negligible. And the dose does not affect the outcome. This dose will not affect the outcome of the pregnancy compared to control populations exposed to a background radiation that's less than one milligray. And it's really important to know that 100 millisieverts is the known threshold, and we don't even get there with our normal procedures. So it's very important to keep that in mind. So now switching gears then, with those numbers in mind, it's really important then to understand how we can keep ourselves safe in the cath lab. And we are probably very familiar with the x-ray system, but let's do a really quick review. Here's a patient-centered view. Now, you have the x-ray source below the table, and here you have ra the, radi the flat panel detector above the patient, right? Remember that the x-ray tube is the main source of radiation, but once that beam hits the patient, the, the pink field that you're seeing going in and out, the scatter radiation is what is 
exposing everybody in the room, especially the operator who is standing right next to the patient. So it's very important to understand that the patient becomes a source of radiation due to scatter. And so when you think about the provider-centered view, right, it's really important to think about your flat panel detector, bringing it down, positioning it in a way that's gonna really decrease radiation exposure and keeping yourself away from the x-ray tube as well, not just the patient. We're gonna talk about those techniques, but a good mnemonic that I like to remember is table up and II down, II being the flat panel detector image intensifier, because you want your table height to be raised so that the patient's dose is lowered. You want the flat panel detector to be as close to the patient's skin as possible to minimize attenuation and space of air. It's closer to the patient it is, the less um, exposure to the patient, and therefore, the less radi uh, scatter radiation to you. Um, this is just some brief definitions about you know, radiation exposure concepts. And I think what's important here is that air kerma really is your a skin exposure dose. It's the, ener it's the kinetic energy of the radiation that is, goes through the air. But it's important to know that absorbed dose is specific to the tissue and that the equivalent dose would be specific to a particular organ. And the effective dose actually is your whole body dose. But you can review these in, on your own because it's pretty dry and it's mostly just definitions. I think what's really important then as an operator, you've got to really think about three fundamentals. Time. Time spent on the pedal is radiation exposure. If you're not stepping on the pedal, you're not getting exposed. Never step on the pedal if you're not looking at your screen in front of you. And that's really important, especially when you're with trainees or you're training. If you're looking down, don't step on the pedal. Save yourself the radiation exposure. So spend less time on the pedal or not at all. Distance. Remember that you need to increase the distance from the x-ray source because it can cut your exposure by, by one fourth, by, by a fourth. And that's huge. Shielding. Shielding is very important, not just on your body, which we're going to talk about, but how you put the shield in front of you, and as well as the way you use the apron dress on the table itself, is very important to block out that extra um, radiation. It's very important to remember to do these things when you are busy, when you are stressed, when the patient's coming in with cardiogenic shock, when it's a STEMI. And the way to get these skills down is to practice them every single day when it's a diagnostic. There's no easy case, but starting it when you know you're going into the lab and you can build this good routine for yourself, you're gonna be able to keep it when things are going really fast, when the patient is crashing. So putting it all together, one of the ways that I like to think about it, because in a male-dominated field, I like to embrace femininity, and I like to remember things that can bring that out when I'm getting ready for a case. And I like to think of it as an interventional outfit. You are going to put on your skirt, and you're going to put on your lead apron. It's really important that if you're buying an apron that has two um, pieces, like they wrap around, remember, that the, that the anterior piece is only full coverage if the second piece fully lines up. So I chose an apron that had the full gamut straight and I attach it in the back. And that was my choice because I didn't think I was gonna snap it on perfectly every time and I didn't want to expose myself. I use shoulder pads to protect my left side of um, my body, my left breast in particular. And I, to balance it out, I also wear a right shoulder pad. Sometimes it gets heavy. It's just something that I considered. Not everybody has to do that. Always remember to wear your thyroid collar, uh, your collarbone, your thyroid, extremely radiosensitive. Um, and then everything else that you're seeing on here, ring dosimeter, we really don't do that in, in um, interventional cardiology. We really don't use lead gloves, but it, it has been used before. Leg shields, again, your, your x-ray source is close to the floor, but these are things that have been add-on and not always um, used. Pretty standard would be the leather apron, some shoulder pads, and make sure you have your badge on, on the skirt, as well as your thyroid collar outside. And when you're pregnant, inside, that's your fetal dosimeter. Remember never to sit in your lead. I know it's tempting. You just got out. You want to look at the films. Everybody wants to sit down. It's been a long case. Take your lead off. 
Number one, it's good for your back. Number two, don't sit in your leg, you'll crack it. And if you crack it, it's not gonna protect you. So really quick about lead apron thickness, 0.5 millimeter thickness will attenuate 98 to 99.5%. But remember, that's heavy. It could have an impact on your back and we have seen occupational um, orthopedic injuries, no matter what stage of your career it is. It really has to do with root, the more you do the cases wearing heavy lead, the more susceptible you are to an orthopedic injury. So keep that in mind. 0.35 millimeter lead will attenuate approximately 95 to 96% of the scatter radiation. And that's important. That's a lot. Uh, we've already talked about the rest. When it comes to using radiation protection for your eyes, it's very important to know that what are we trying to prevent? We're trying to prevent cataracts. And 0.75 millimeter lead equivalent glasses can decrease the dose by a factor of five to 10. But remember, the, the lead that you're wearing on the glass is like this, like how I'm looking at the screen. So if you were, if you were looking at, if you were my image that I'm looking at in the cath lab, the patient's to this side, correct? So that means the radiation exposure is actually coming this way. I wear lead glasses that have lead on the side, but the, if you don't and you've already invested in them, that's okay. Make sure you always use that shield. The shield that you can put in front of you is helping protect you and it's helping reduce your risk of cataracts. And I know sometimes when things are getting really busy, the shield is out, you know, on the west side of the building, you know, of the room and you've forgotten it. And then, or sometimes it gets kicked out of position because you've gone caudal and now the shield's over there and nobody remembers to bring it back. Remember to bring it back. Remember to position it always in front of you so you can block that, that, that radiation exposure to your eye, okay? That's really all I wanted to say about that. Let's talk about table position. There's really, there really is, um, this is supposed to move, but there really is no problem. There is an optimal position. And what I was getting at here, this is the optimal position. You want the table up because remember, this is your x-ray source. And so you want the patient, you want the image flan, or you want, there's two images, there's two places of distance that you need to consider. Number one, where is the patient with respect to the x-ray source below? And number two, where is the image intensifier, the flat panel detector? And this is what's optimal. So you want the table position to be up not so close to the x-ray source because remember the x-ray source is trying to get to the image flat panel detector as well to create the image the more you separate the two the more exposure there's going to be the more x-ray that's going to get used however when you bring them close together and you raise the table up you can decrease your radiation exposure significantly so this is optimal and i really love that mnemonic table up eye eye down so keep that in mind okay um, Lead apron caps, there has been some debate. Uh, the, the, if you're thinking about getting a cap, it's gotta be 0.5 millimeter lead equivalents. Um, it's important to know that there's been data to suggest, and this is observational data, that LAO projections, as we all know, increase radiation exposure, particularly on the left side of the operator's head, there's a high level of scatter radiation. And there have been reports of occupational radiation exposure induced malignancy with left side involvement. It's speculative. It's important to also know that there's anecdotal reports that wearing this heavy lead cap can cause migraine headaches and be uncomfortable. So remember, if you have that shield in front of you, you are protecting the left side of your head as well. So keep that in mind. Distance from the image intensifier, where you stand, where you stand has a huge impact in the amount of radiation you're getting exposed to just by taking one step. If you increase your working distance, working close to the patient from 40 centimeters to 80 centimeters, you can decrease scatter radiation to about one fourth of the original dose. That's huge. And it's a simple thing, right? It's taking one or two steps to the right. And if you're a radial operator like myself, and you're worried, we are closer when we're working with the wrist, but you can use longer tubing to get extra movement. Also, a lot of the radi ra radial boards sometimes also have additional radiation protection, but remember distance from the image intensifier. 
avoiding steep angulation and how you, you know, really good hygiene as an operator, you've got to get good images, right? Don't compromise on your images. Everybody's got to get a steep shot every now and then to open up that lesion. But remember, every time you really go out of a 30 degree angulation, there's a lot of radiation exposure that's used to attenuate the skin. High angles, especially like in the LAO projection, right? Now you're adding LAO projection, but even steep caudal cranial angulations that are very steep, almost quadruple the amount of radiation exposure. So it's very important. Try not to work in those views for difficult cases. Try to minimize uh, your time in those, in those um, angles. So to summarize briefly what we've talked about, Alara is a very well-known radiation safety co concept as low as reasonably achievable. Remember to decrease the number and the length of cine acquisitions and fluoro time. Use fluoro store when you can. I've given you the mnemonic table up, II down, remember that. Minimize steep C arm angulations, avoid repetitive angles. You also have an increased risk of patient dose skin injury. Limit digital magnification. Remember to cone in if you need to cone in and mag up again, one or two shots like that. But magnification really increases radiation exposure and can be dangerous for you when you're trying to keep your dose limits down. And apply collimation as often as possible. And you know, I'm so glad that the webinar is being sponsored by Medtronic because lean on your industry partners to also help you understand how technology and software upgrades can help you reduce radiation exposure. That's also really important. And advocate, advocate, advocate. Work with a nurse champion or your director of the cath lab to ask about this stuff. How can we reduce radiation exposure? Are we even tracking it? And so when it comes to understanding if a culture to promote radiation safety and decreasing radiation exposure could even work, I'd like to share the study with you and I may reference um, some, some numbers because I think they really highlight what Mayo Clinic did. And so this is a single center study from Mayo Clinic that looked at 18, about 18,000 procedures over a three year period. And what they looked at, they said, if we introduce radiation safety measures and ways to reduce radiation exposure in the cath lab, can we make a difference? And can we impact a culture of change that would have benefit to our patient? And as a result, a benefit to the, the physician's exposure. So here you're looking at cumulative skin dose and all of the procedures that actually in the first quarter versus the last quarter had reduction in their cumulative skin dose. Now I just wanna read you a couple of things just to really take this point home. What they did was very practical and very simple. You see over 27 staff cardiologists and 65 fellows of training, all they did was they started to create intra-procedure radiation dose announcements. They started to report when procedures had an air perma greater than 6,000 milligray. They established standard x-ray imaging protocols that included collimation, increasing the, we talked about, so the uh, collimation, they reduced the detector target dose for fluoroscopy and acquisition imaging, and they reduced the fluoroscopy frame rate to seven and a half seconds. They were able to decrease the cumulative skin dose from 969 to 568 milligray. That's a reduction of 40% over three years. Simple things. They didn't have to buy any technology. They just implemented new rules and they enforced them. And I think that that's a very uplifting point that we can all champion this in our practice or our cath labs if we can find momentum to create this change. So I just wanna thank Women as One for helping bring awareness to this topic and allowing me to present it to all of you. And thank you for giving me the platform to share it with you today. Looking forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much, Sheila. That was, that was excellent. Um, and I think it's gonna be a really good discussion to figure out, okay, so, you know, what do we do with this information? How do we how do we interpret this? And so, Carla, I, I don't know if you have some thoughts or, or want to lead us off, but I, I think that'd be great. Uh, it's a great segue to, to lead the conversation. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shayla. It's a fantastic talk regarding radiation safety. I'm going to talk about, uh, to tell you about my history with radiation exposure. Uh, I started my training in interventional cardiology almost 
18 years ago in France. Later, when I moved to Buenos Aires working with Liliana Greenfield. You know very well Liliana Greenfield. She was one of my mentor and friend. And Liliana told me when she was pregnant in the 80s, uh, she worked in the lab with two leather aprons to cover herself during all the pregnancy because there were no regulation at that time regarding radiation safety. In 2009, when I was pregnant with a 38 years old, uh, my decision was, was to stay out of the lab working in clinician research and outpatient consultation. In my hospital, for example, till 2013, there were no regulation at all regarding radiation safety. Uh, we, we started to have some kind of regulation when we applied to Sean Commission in my place. And one of my technicians, I think she is in the attended, Patricia Scura, she works a lot in uh, make a document to uh, take care of our dosimetry, take care uh, about our leather apron condition. They teach a lot about how to protect ourselves or, or saying uh, you are doing too much fluoroscopy or your, your, uh, um, your, your uh, intensificator is too high. So you need in your lab someone to say, listen, you are doing too much radiation or listen, you put not well your leather apron. Uh, I, I want to open the discussion uh, about what, what was your own experience in your place in Aura and the attendance regarding this matter, pregnancy and radiation? Well, in fact, I, in pregnancy exactly, I don't have really any experience, but the real experience and the shock was getting into a public hospital and getting some lead aprons like from the 40s, I, I think, I don't know, we, they get into the floor and they waited, I think, like 20 kilos every apron. And they used to be in some, in the floor or some on, on, over the chairs or the tables. And we started working like that. And when we started, uh, we were forming the vascular surgery department at that hospital. And well, it's, it's important that everyone has to know about all, all this. And especially if you're a woman, if you are, if, if you are expecting to be pregnant or, or even you're just a woman working with x-rays. So um, we start asking for different, different kinds of aprons and they came like four years later and and it was difficult to work with 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 the one with the older ones and well we try to manage with all the industry that went to the hospital to lend someone some of the aprons to us and that we used to work and it was difficult we we had to learn how to protect ourselves and because we didn't even have a vascular suite or something. We used to work with an CRT and it's, it's really different. Uh, I think uh, Sheila, a question about what you are talking about, all the details regarding pro radiation protection. In the US, US, when you declare that you're pregnant, you have the option to be inside the lab move to another area, uh, stay in consultation. You have options uh, to, to, to place in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the area that you want to be safe. You know, that's a, it's an excellent question about what happens, what's the impact of declaring, and especially because sometimes you might want to declare to your radiation safety officer, but perhaps you don't want to declare to your boss or if you're in a private practice. I think every uh, employed 
position in an academic center versus private practice is definitely different. And I think as interventionalists, we are always dealing with hospitals. So if you're in a private practice, one benefit of that, like for instance, my setup is that I could tell the radiation safety officer in the hospital, and he's probably not gonna disclose it to my employer if they're outside. But when you're an employed physician, then that could impact your call schedule. If you take the choice to not wanna be in the cath lab, and ultimately it is a personal choice, and what is important, I think, with the purpose of this webinar is to inform women that if their choice is to stay in the lab, they don't necessarily have to wear double lead and they don't, um, they, they actually don't need to if they look at recent data, which is on Women as One's more longer length webinar, you don't have to wear double lead and you will be safe having a baby, but it's up to you. And that's a personal choice. But if your choice is to have the pregnancy and, and your employer is telling you that you have to stay out of the lab, then this data needs to be brought to their attention. So I think it's difficult to know. And I think one, the part that's really difficult that women deal with is what happens with the judgment. Where there's, where there's no way to put that in tangible form. They're not telling us we're fired or that they're pushing us out, but there is a judgment when you are pregnant and you're working in the lab. For instance, I'm the for, I'll be the first woman in my, I'm the, one of the only women in my cath lab. I am the only woman. There was one, she left two years ago. And I know that every female nurse, when they're pregnant, they're taken out. So what are they gonna say when I'm pregnant? And I know what they'll say, but, and that's a challenge I think women face regardless of who their employer is. And there's a lot of difficulty, I think, both private and academic sector in the way that people perceive you and your choices. And that's difficult to measure. And I think it takes having a strong ally and a mentor. And I think you, we need both. We need them on the, we need men who support us. We need women who support us. And for the women who don't have strong mentors, we're lucky to have an international forum, or at least now we're lucky to have women as one to bring us together to help us get that support. But it's, it's a difficult question to answer for everyone. Uh, I, I have another question. I know you know that the most of the students are female and the most of the internal medicine uh, interns are female right now in, in all of our places. Uh, what do you think we need to do to encourage our cardiology colleagues, our internal medicine colleagues to go for, to interventional cardiology as a passionate cell specialty because they fear about radiation how we need to convince that we can work we do we have fun we we can uh, travel and know other colleagues uh, uh, in in different places and and we are safe in our work how how how, how we need to pass the message that's a great question too. And Nora, I'd love to know your opinion as well. Um, I'm working with the American College of Cardiology's Women in Cardiology section. We have been championing this for a very long time. We are lucky in that finally Medscape's most recent um, study showed that we've, we've actually increased. So there is now 16% are willing to go into cardiology with medical graduates. And that's an increase definitely over the last six years. Um, and, but it's not enough, sorry, the last four years, it's not enough. There was a time where women would have rather been urologists. Can you believe? Cardiology was losing out to urology. But again, that's general cardiology, which we all know is very fun because we do a lot of general cardiology as interventionalists. But to be honest, as interventional cardiologists, we need to expose ourselves to these women. We need to show them what we're doing. So we did a webinar with Italy and Alade Piefo, and I was convincing her to get on Instagram because women need to see her, they need to see you, they need to see Nora. Women who look like you, who identify with you, who, who understand, who admire you, but don't have access to you. They need to see you, and they need to see you doing the simplest things. Talking to me tonight, doing a case tomorrow, preparing for your tavern, even if it's a selfie, because one image could show a woman who doesn't have any access to any women. 
I mean, I think the other thing we should do is we should partner with our local uh, schools and bring them in for uh, the possibility of shadowing. And I think COVID has really affected that. There were a number of students I was going to bring in this summer and I couldn't, I felt it was too much exposure. We can't have so many extra um, observers, but I think that's something that we need to think about. And the mentorship needs to begin early, right? Because once they get to medicine, if they have a bad experience, now they're completely differentiated or, or they're not even interested. And then once they get to general cardiology, they, it, it takes, you know, I was very lucky. The way that I, I trained in internal medicine in New York, which was different when I did my cardiology in LA, and the way the cath lab was shown to me was completely different. I was so empowered. So that's important too for program directors to know, but if you have access to internal medicine residents, grab them, talk to them, tell them how much you love your field and let them decide, but at least you know you've impacted. I can't measure this in data, right? We, these are small anecdotal nuggets. It's like the wise words of women, what can we say? But I, I can tell from my Instagram, a lot of girls contact me from all over the world thanking me that they have no mentors, no women to see. And they get told that because they're a woman, they can't go into radi um, any radiation exposure. It's, it's really sad and it's really backwards. So both of you, I'd love to know what your experience has been talking to younger women and j just looking at you is so inspiring to me. So I can only imagine how you would inspire the next generation. Thank you. I think uh, the big, big, big message is the, uh, radiation safety basics is really, really very important, not only for women or for pregnant women, for everybody in the lab. And I think the second thing it's really important to have a mentor, a mentor in your way to empower you to do even radiation. Uh, if you are passionate in, in, in performing interventional cardiology, you need to go. Uh, I don't know, Nora, if you have in your way some mentors in your way to, to push you to do uh, the, 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 the specialty you, you love. Uh, if you have some task in your way, t tell us what happened with you in your own place. Oh, that's, <laughs> it will take maybe, maybe more than an hour to talk about most of it, but uh, I had great mentors. But as a, I think that all the education about radiology protection, uh, it was not part of the, of the program. It's not part of the, of the formal program. You have to learn it by taking the, the, the training uh, at the hospital or, or someone else. Someone else. Uh, and it's, it was kind of, kind of shocking when you when you see that most of the appealing thing of doing vascular surgery in Mexico, for at least the, the, the trainings I've known, is that you can that you they they could access to the, the X-ray room and do some endovascular procedures and that that was some of the some of the reasons that they that lead them to to do the vascular surgery and, and the vascular surgery. And when you are there with the trainees and you are responsible for them, and it's, it's kind of difficult to, to, to fight against. Maybe the things have been done for maybe the last 20 years that maybe in the hospital, um, the, they were like just radiology interventionists do the procedures and they were not used that the vascular surgeon could do them also. So the, as I, I, I was told, telling you, know, they send us the, the old aprons and when we asked for the dosimeters, uh, we, we waited for almost a year to have a dosimeter. And well, uh, when, we, when there was a course in the hospital, uh, uh, some training for, for radiological protection, we, we, they granted us just two spots or three spots. And we were like 15 getting exposed every day, you know? And well, 
let send the trainees because they are getting even more than us. No, they are almost every day getting into the, the into the lab. So it was it was difficult, but and step by step we started to have the simeters, getting our labs done and getting all the all this getting into the surveillance program that maybe if the if the vascular surgery department existed like maybe irregularly for the last 15 years they didn't have any of that and it was difficult to to start pushing that we were we were part of that of that too and I left the hospital around a year and a half ago and well uh, we had uh, most of the trainees with the with the with the training in, in radiology radiol protection and all of them had a dosimeter and well I, I think the things got better but we found many stones in the in the road <laughs> And if I could just talk a little bit from Women as One's end, if that's okay. Um, this, you know, the, and thank you, Sheila, for putting the link in, in the chat, and I will send this out in follow-up. You know, the reason why we put together, and, and this is really Sheila's brainchild, um, we put together radiation safety is because there, to, to our knowledge, is no universal training on radiation safety. And if we want more women in interventional cardiology, if we want more women in, in EP or women in specialties with radiation, we need training. We need data. We need to understand what the protections are. We need to understand why policies don't match the data. And you can't, you can't create a new policy if you don't have data to support it. And so the whole reason why we did this and the reason we made it digital and the reason we worked with Selassie for endorsement is to make this a global issue where we can make real change and we can get women to understand if you're protecting yourself, if you are um, understand radiation, then the choice is yours to um, be pregnant and, and be in the lab and and also for you know for policies to understand that data as well so i i think that you know change takes time but we're really excited and hopeful that this module can help people um, and help people understand what what radiation exposure is and and this specifically for for women but it's also for men too right i think we have men and male attendees on the line this is a global issue on on safety and we need to understand for all trainees that are interested in, in interventional cardiology male and female how do you protect yourself and then doubly how do you protect yourself if you're pregnant so i i think it's you know we're really excited about this and we're so thankful to have this platform today to talk about it because i think that you know this is how we change is by talking about this and bringing together modules that can help us understand you know what do you do so I think there is another question in the in, in the chat for Sheila. Uh, do you use the tone stain aprons in your place? What type of apron of protection do you have? Ah, you you are you're mute. a mute, Sheila. Yeah. Yes, I believe there tungsten alloy uh i believe i actually i have to double check i'm pretty sure almost all of them there's almost all of them are tungsten x-ray there they are a tungsten alloy that's usually what they all come in um so yeah i've never actually asked the elemental because most of it is mainstream tung tungsten so, so Sheila, I'm sorry to jump in. This is Juan speaking. That's because you are in the U.S. <laughs> in Latin America, we use plum, you know, the, the old one, the, the old one and the thicker and really heavy. The tungsten weigh probably like 30% or 20% of the old ones that we are using. So this is, and, this is interesting. And they are more context. expensive. They're yeah, more expensive. Probably three yeah. or four times. So usually what you yeah. will find 
in CAT labs for any type of interventions are the, the, the old ones uh, really, really heavy. Yeah, I, I, you know, here, so I actually do wear, um, I, w I, I wear heavy lead. Um, I wear 0.5 millimeter equivalent. And there is a company that I usually, um, I, I like a lot of them. So they use a combination of antimony and bismuth. There's antimony lead. And then uh, usually in America, you can get like a lighter weight lead as well. But we've usually, when you're purchasing the lead, you go by the lead equivalents. And so most companies um, will come in a 0.25, a 0.35, and a 0.5. But I've never asked the alloy. Asked the alloy. Now looking up the company I've used, it's an antimony bismuth. Um, so it's actually not tungsten, but it sounds like tungsten is more um, internationally used. Great question. I don't know if you have another question, Nora or Erica. No, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think th they have different. I, I we have here from Brazil. I think they say that I live in Brazil and you use also tungsten high prom. You're lucky. <laughs> Great. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I'm just going to end with a few slides for us, if that's okay. Can you all see my screen? Okay. I'm seeing some nods, so I'm hoping that's okay. So I'm just going to end with, first off, thank you to Sheila and Nora and, and Carla for a wonderful conversation and wonderful presentation. I think it's been uh, just great having you and, and thank you for letting us talk to you from Women as One. Um, for those of you that, that may not know, who, what's this Women as One organization and what do you do? Um, so we are a uh, nonprofit that uh, focuses on gender equality in medicine, particularly within cardiology and we work globally. So I am American, but we, our reach is global. One of our uh, co-founders is uh, from France, um, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Marie Claude Maurice and Dr. Roxana Moran here in the United States. Um, we work very closely with Carla and Selassie and just value her partnership and her friendship um, to make sure that we're bringing these issues globally because these are not um, you know, United States issues, they're global issues, it's not male, you know, men, it's not women issues, they're, 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 they're male issues as well, they're issues that affect all of us. And so I'm just going to walk through a couple of resources that we have from Women is One that I think will help this conversation. Um, so we have um, on our website, uh, we have what we call the pregnant cardiologist and um, it's at womenisone.org slash retention. And I'll send this in an email so you don't need to write anything down. Um, but the entire, um, the entire module on radiation safety is available on our website. Uh, we also wrote a paper with EAPCI on uh, having stronger radiation safety measures and how that's essential. And we just wrapped up a global uh, survey on parental leave and we will be sharing the results uh, shortly. So um, this page is for policies on fair and safe practices for pregnant cardiologists and we're always adding to this. Um, another resource that is very timely is right now through the end of the month, October 30th, we have our annual Escalator Awards. Um, and this year we are offering awards uh, for, men, uh, for, for women across all career stages. Uh, so for that, our women that are um, 10 years out of training, they have the opportunity to apply for our research award uh, where we will offer a monetary grant of 50,000 US dollars on uh, research um, proposals. Um, as well as this year, we are offering our Mentor Match Award, where we have women that are uh, above 10 years of training and then fellows that are paired together that work on either a research, uh, education, or quality improvement uh, topic. And this is also a monetary grant for that. Um, and so this year, we have nine awards that we're offering. This is absolutely a global award. So please, please, please apply or tell your colleagues, um, we really want to escalate the careers of women um, and would love to have uh, great representation this year from, from Latin America. 
And then finally, um, one thing that we're really excited to uh, have Medtronic be a partner for us uh, is our Climb Skills Training Program that we just launched to um, increase the technical skills uh, for performing complex interventional procedures. And while we have chosen the women for this program, you can access all training free of charge as long as you're signed up and the women as one website. So for, for those that would like more, um, you know, understanding of, of complex procedures on anything from CTO to imaging, uh, this is a great opportunity to lead, learn from leaders in the field. Um, and we actually have a really great uh, contingency from, from Latin America. I think Medtronic helped us out finding some really wonderful talent. Um, but now that we're all on Zoom all the time and, and not able to see each other, I think this is a great way for us to connect digitally and to connect, to connect globally. And so would encourage you to um, sign up on Women as One and, and take advantage of this, uh, of this opportunity. So um, Juan, I don't know if you want to say anything before we wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Erica. It has been a pleasure to have all of you here in, in this meeting. Sheila, I really appreciate your engagement, your enthusiasm, Erica. We really like to keep this relation with Women's mm -hmm. One growing as much as we can. Carla, Nora, thank you very much. But we need to be creative and try to, I don't know, but maybe look for more interesting things. Uh, if you just hear the talk that all of you and the comment that all of you are made, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a story of. Uh, frustration and in many aspects and discrimination in many others and we really believe and and I did as in the, all my career as a physician as, as an interventional cardiology and I try to do it in the front we really need that you woman empower yourself mm. to accept roles when we invite you to be a speaker to be a panelist, to be a moderator, to be in, it's not only interventional cardiology, we try to have, Nora it's a, it's a vascular surgeon who is working in peripheral. We are working, we are trying to find uh, female physicians in the area of, uh, uh, let's say, um, cardiac rim disorders also, and, uh, and, and, and other stuff like aortic aneurysmas, et cetera. So as much as you communicate this with your colleagues, the, the movement will grow and grow, and you will feel more with more opportunities for many different mm -hmm. physicians really capable that we have around. So uh, for my side, from, I appreciate, again, the, all the help. Thank you, Liliana Gonzalez, who is leading Latin America, and she's supporting this uh, session. I don't know if you want to close. I really appreciate some work from you, Liliana. Yeah, thank you so much, Juan. Uh, you know, I was uh, chatting with him. It breaks my heart, you know, when I hear the stories. Mm -hmm. at, at the same time, we have so much energy and we are going to change it little by little. But, you know, we have taken this initiative to really support our female doctors. And, and sometimes, you know, we are quite frustrated because they don't show up and we are expecting so much passion here. But we understand this is a path. Count on us. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so engaged with all these calls that uh, please uh, let's make sure that we really embrace it and, and bring more people with this um, and it's in our hands. So I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you, uh, Sheila. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Carla and Erika. And of course, Juan, who has been always a big, big champion here. So we count on you with more, you know, physicians, uh, male physicians also, because yeah, you ask opportunities, but not always so. <laughs> Thank you so much to all, and I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you all. We appreciate it.